Good evening, and welcome to Hard Fire. I'm your host, Mark Axon, and it's my pleasure to welcome you again for another half-hour discussion of politics and contemporary events from a libertarian perspective. Tonight, we're going to do something slightly different. We're going to talk about a free market system in education in the 19th century and the implications that it has for the 21st. My guest is John Chodes. John is a uh, playwright, a writer who's had over 100 articles in uh, the New York Times, Reason Magazine, The Freeman, several other publications, and he's an expert on education history. John, welcome to Hard Fire. Thank you, Mark. My Good pleasure to, to have you. Good to be here. So, John, I understand that there was another system in the education world other than the government. That's correct. I'd like to start it this way, though. Parents today are very dissatisfied with public education. Their kids turn out to be illiterate, uh, passive, uh, not qualified to uh, make it in the, in the real world. But parents are trapped because they feel they have no alternative. Well, what alternative well, the would there be? The other alternative that, that exists today, say, are private schools, religious schools, private schools, but they're tremendously expensive. Uh, most parents cannot afford to send their kids to those schools. So they feel trapped, they feel ha they have no alternative, and they can't see truthfully that the free market can come up with a system that would rival Uncle Sam. For instance, they can't believe that any private system could spend, as Uncle Sam does, $400 billion a year subsidizing schools throughout the United States. So they feel trapped and they accept what is. But, but it wasn't. It was, but it hasn't always been that way. It is that hasn't correct? always been that way. If I may, I'd like to mm -hmm. describe briefly. Back in the uh, end of the 18th century, we're talking about the 1790s, a young uh, British uh, Quaker named Joseph Lancaster was born in the slums of London. Now, as a Quaker, he was, the Quaker religion was outlawed in England, and the only religion that was accepted was the Anglican religion, the Church of England mm -hmm. religion. So he could not go to any British public school, and he couldn't get most jobs that existed. His father taught him at home, but Lancaster from the time he was, say, 15 or 16, was very, very bitter and angry that he, a poor kid, was so uh, disenfranchised from getting ahead in society and he vowed even as a kid to to create a system where ki where children like him would be able to get a good education they might have to pay for it their parents would have to pay for it it would be inexpensive but it would allow them to rise up in a system that prevented them from rising up okay and we have a photograph uh, of a painting yes. from uh, from when Lancaster was a young adult for our viewers, Correct. which they are probably seeing now. Tell me what Lancaster's system was. It went worldwide. It taught millions of kids around the world, uh, including the United States. I'd like to show you a picture of uh, the system. Here are 10 kids standing in a circle. There's one kid uh, uh, with a pointer. Lancaster couldn't afford to pay adult teachers. But this turned out to be a positive because he said, well, what about if the kids taught the kids? Were they kids at the same level teaching each other? Or no. were they, um, or were they uh, older children teaching the younger ones? Older teaching the younger. Say a 10-year-old who had mastered reading, writing, arithmetic, he would teach 8-year-olds who hadn't mastered that. Once the 8-year-olds had mastered reading, writing, and arithmetic, they became what is called monitors. That was the word for the child teacher. And so in this first etching, the second picture, we have a monitor leading yes. a group of 10 younger students. Correct. And they are standing around him in a semicircle. Correct. And this is, they learned the lesson standing, not sitting. That was deliberate. Kids sitting fall asleep, don't pay attention. If they're standing, they're more alert, and they learn faster. How long did they stand? They alternated between doing their lessons where they had to sit and write and standing where they re did recitation and memorization. Um, 
Okay, so no, you have the group. You have the group standing around. Correct. They're learning from a uh, a uh, from a monitor. A monitor. Who is someone who has excelled and done better and a little bit older, and he's Correct. able to teach them. Correct. And I assume the monitors also went into a system where they the monitor himself might be one of the ten That's with a monitor who's a little bit older than he. And one thing that this system was so terrific at was. Initially, Lancaster brought kids in as teachers because he couldn't afford adults. But the side effect was the kids at very early ages learned tremendous sense of self-reliance, self-realization, self-confidence, and suddenly they had adult responsibilities at 10 years old. This was radical. And did Lancaster set up a system of rewards for those kids? Yes, he did. Now, the next picture is a picture of what he calls merit badges. This was the monetary system in the Lancaster School. With it, the monitors were paid. Of course, there were less than adult teachers' salaries, but the kids were overwhelmed with the happiness that they were getting paid. Uh, they'd never seen money before. And with this, they could buy clothes, they could buy toys, they could buy books, they could buy food, basically anything. And they really felt frankly, on top of the world. They, they had just a sense of being adults. They also had a sense of capitalism and they the value, of, the value of, of, of a being paid for, for the work that you've done. Correct. That's absolutely correct. As opposed to a least common denominator like we have now, correct. where everyone is um, uh, basically treated uh, the same because everyone is equal and there's no that's rewards correct. for that's those who excel. Absolutely correct. And that's another thing. There is the whole excelling process was accelerated by the system. The kid, the younger kid knew if he did well, he'd become a monitor, he'd get paid, he'd have prestige, and it was a huge motivating force. Okay, so much of the time they're spent in the semicircles and, yes. and um, we're looking now once again at a, uh, the etching of the 10 students uh, in a semicircle right. with one student as the monitor. And uh, he's giving them a lesson at this yes. time. But I would like to point out this, is, this picture is the same, but the um, orientation here is different. We're going to talk about economy and how the system was very economical, and this is why it was able to be so cheap. We see the monitor pointing toward a page in a book. Remember, we're talking about the beginning of the, 18th, the 19th century. Paper and books were very expensive. If you have hundreds of kids, you cannot have each one having a textbook. Impossibly expensive. So he devised an idea. He tore every textbook up page by page, put one page on a board in front of the kids. There may have been a hundred of these groups of ten. Each group had one page. When they had memorized that one page, they rotated groups. So one textbook could be used for the entire term's uh, lessons. Uh, and this obviously was very uh, economical and made it possible to uh, have the parents pay a very low fee for their kids in school. We have another picture. The uh, 10 students now sitting with slate tablets. Correct. Again, paper very expensive. Slate is indestructible, it can last for 20, 30, 50 years. So all the students wrote on slate, they wrote with chalk, and just erased the chalk marks and, and wrote more. But this way, again, a huge economy measure, making it easier for parents to buy into the system for their kids. Okay, so now my question to you from before was, how did you have a thousand people in one room? All right. We now have a picture, a diagram of a Lancaster classroom. In the middle, we see the benches that the kids sit on. A thousand kids can sit on these benches. Along the walls, we see semicircles. These are the semicircles that we saw before. Each group of 10, there are 100 semicircles. At the front of this is one adult. I didn't mention that this is a franchise system, uh, like McDonald's and Burger King, a franchise system. Mm -hmm. Someone buys into the plan, they pay an annual fee, and they get into the Lancaster system. They become, and he would be the headmaster And of that adult system. would be the headmaster. Usually he had been a principal or an owner of a school before, so he had. Now, he did nothing but sit and look. 
a thousand kids every 10 learning a different subject, speaking out loud, tremendous amount of noise, apparent chaos, but the monitors kept everything under control in their group, and there was no chaos. In actuality, there was a lot of noise, but the adult had nothing to do, but periodically there might be a problem. But largely, he was a passive bystander. Sort of like the uh, principals today in uh, schools. But they're pa passive principals because they don't want to do the job, as opposed to being perfect, perfectly happy with how it's going. It's noisy, but it's productive. All right, well, this is a gentleman who has put some money down, yes, he bought has. into the franchise, Correct. and he now has the students in, that in the room. So uh, this, that was a schematic, and I think you also have a diagram yes. of groups of the students yes. in the semicircles along the sides. Yes, now this is what it looks like when all the kids are standing. There are 100 groups of 10 with each with their own monitor, each learning something different from a different page in the textbook. Again, it apparently is chaos and noisy, but that monitor has strict control over his platoon, his little group of 10, and the work gets done, and the adult really has nothing to do. John, how... Uh what time and frame are we talking now? We're talking early 19th century? The big, it really started in the 1790s and was in existence up until the 1850s and 60s. So like a 70-year period. Okay, and did it catch the attention of some of the powers that be? Yes, we can go to a picture of the very stylish King George III. I think he's well known uh, in these parts. I think we had a revolution against him. If That's I That's possible, but he wasn't all bad. <laughs> Tell me about George III's reaction all right. to the Lancaster system. Well, let, let's say, let's start it this way. King George III realized he had a huge illiteracy problem in England, and it was very hard to solve because it was, it was an overwhelming social problem. Some of his aides told him that they had been to a Lancaster school and saw how incredible it was. And King George said, I want to have an audience with Lancaster. He invited him to Windsor Castle. First thing King George said, Lancaster, how is it possible to have 1,000 kids in one room all learning different things and not have total chaos? Well, Your Excellency, they're controlled by every group of Ted has one child, a monitor, controlling them. And he went through the whole rigmarole of how the system worked. And King George was flabbergasted. And he said, I'm going to give you a lot of money, Lancaster, out of my personal income, not the state's income. I want you to build your system of schools all over England to conquer this illiteracy problem that we have. So, and, and it, it did. And, and did that begin? This created, this made Lancaster an international star. And did it pick up on the continent as well? All over Europe, all over Asia, all over the United States. But a fly in the ointment was created. England is a very class conscious society. The aristocrats of England saw Lancaster as a social revolutionary who would destroy the class system because his system was geared toward the poor and disenfranchised and giving them the kind of education that would let them not only be ditch diggers like their fathers, but enter the white collar world and... At a reasonable price too, which, which, well, only, which before only the wealthy could that's afford. That's correct. So they saw him as a very dangerous radical and he had to be eliminated. Lancaster had to be eliminated. So All let right. us go to the next picture. The Reverend Colonel Andrew Bell. Colonel in the British Army? Andrew Bell was a chaplain colonel in the British Colonial Army stationed in Madras, India. Uh, a place with no caste system at all, right? Super caste system, and this is part of the story. Now, the Reverend Colonel Be the Andrew Bell was in charge of an orphanage in Madras, India. His job was to teach these children, they were not really orphans, what they were is illegitimate kids. 
in India, which has an extremely stringent cl caste and class system, illegitimate kids are called and classified as untouchables. Mm -hmm. This is the lowest of the low. Untouchables are never allowed to get an education, never allowed to get a job. Their life is spent begging in the streets and sleeping in the streets all their life. All right, so tell me about what Bell So did. Bell said, this is, uh, this is horrible. I, I've got to educate these kids to get them out of this horrible cycle. But no Indian teacher would teach them because if they did, they would be classified as untouchables because they had touched the lowest Interacted of the low. Interacted with the, with the, the lower caste. The lowest of the low. So by the sheerest coincidence, he came up with the monitorial idea too. The was same he as cognizant Lancaster. of Lancaster? No, they were not. He was on the other end of the world. By sheer coincidence, he came up because he said, the only way to teach them is the older kid. I'll teach them how to read, write, and do math. They'll teach the smaller kids, and maybe they'll get out of this nightmare. All right, so it's a similar system to what Lancaster yes, has. Yes, except for one thing. The army, which he belonged to, is part of the government. The government and the army are very class conscious, so, and very anti self assertive. So his system did not teach, enforced all the class consciousness of England and did not make kids feel self-assertive or self-reliant or have adult responsibilities. So it superficially was similar, but in actuality, very negatively different. About okay. how long is this lasting now? Five, ten years? or? About how long is, is Bell's system in, in effect? Well, we have it isn't in effect yet. We're going to get to well, that Bell now. Has, Bell has a system. He has an idea. He doesn't have a system. He has one place, if I may mm -hmm. interject. What happened was the aristocracy in England learned about his system and said, wow, this is the counterstroke to Lancaster. They went to, to Parliament. They asked for millions of dollars to build schools to promote the Madras system, Bell system. Co uh, Parliament agreed. And they did this because Lancaster was a threat was to a them. It was a terrible threat to social stability as they saw The it. class system the in class England system. And, and, and in the continent. Correct. All right, so Bell is getting support from the government, Correct. from Parliament. More than support, millions of dollars, and to build schools, just like Burger King and uh, McDonald's, they're going to build the schools directly across the street from Lancaster. But there's a difference. They're not privately That's held. Correct. They're not private but franchises using... like, um, like um, you were describing That's with correct. Lancaster. Correct. Uh, but they're using a similar marketing technique, which is a parent has to pay for the Lancaster school. But the Bell schools are tax supported, so they're free. So even though They're free, meaning they're... paid for by others. Correct. Correct. Okay. So the Which parents, is a very basic concept correct. to libertarians. Uh, we all understand that right. one. You pay it, I'll, I'll, I'll buy it. Uh, so the parents who were poor felt they were getting the same product and they went over to the Bell schools, but of course it was a different product. Anyway, Lancaster was bled to death through this method and his whole system disappeared in Europe and Asia rapidly because every country in Europe and Asia saw him as a, a radical, and he had to be destroyed, and they all used the same plan, and he was gone. All right, what was happening in the United States at all that right. time? Let us go to a picture of DeWitt Clinton, governor of New York, 10-time mayor of New York, very famous political figure in New York State. DeWitt Clinton believed that the only schools that should exist would be state tax-funded schools. He f despised private and religious schools. He felt the schools had to perform a social, not a personal, role. When he became governor, there were 95 Lancaster schools in New York City alone. That had come over, the um, idea had yeah, come over from England. Yes. Americans who had gone to England, seen it, been uh, in wonderment, brought the idea and the franchise back to the city okay. and very rapidly 95 schools existed in the city. Now, 
Dewey Clinton was a more intelligent or a greater politician than the fellows in England. He saw that it was impossible to get the money to build a competitive system. So he came up with a better idea. Kill the existing one? But through apparently helping it. Subsidies. Now, this is very important for today. Today, parents say, oh, I would like to get a voucher to send my kid to a better kind of school. I'd like to get to go to a charter school. I would like to go to get to a magnet school. The process is all subsidy. The state is subsidizing this whole process. And if the state is subsidizing it, then the state is controlling it. it. And destroying it. All right, so tell me what happened right. to the system so, in, in New York. So. DeWitt Clinton began to subsidize all the Lancaster schools in New York State. It caused a 40-year legal battle in New York State that went all the way up to the state Supreme Court. And the issue is, if Governor Clinton or any governor of the state subsidizes a private school, it can't have a religious curriculum because the state schools and the state idea is Public education must be religion free. Mm -hmm. Every Lancaster school taught what they call non secular Christianity, uh, meaning a, a, a broad moral sense without offending any particular group. Is but that it, also part of from Lancaster's Quaker background? It's part of his Quaker background, but he felt, and even King George felt, a moral sense of the lower classes is important. Anyway, this became the sticking point. DeWitt Clinton and his following governor said, how can a Lancaster school take a state subsidy, which is the subsidy is for secular education, meaning non-religious education. Lancaster schools have a form of religion, so it's illegal, and we want all our money back. Mm -hmm. And by this time, maybe hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars had been expended on the system. Of course, the Lancaster schools could not pay this money back. So in this 40-year battle, they were gradually absorbed into the state. In the 1850s, after this 40-year battle, a new governmental agency was created called Department of Education? The Board of Education. Board of Education, sure. To God bless them. Everybody loves them. That's correct. And they became the agency to control these Lancaster schools and end the monitorial system. Which were the merit badges with, and everything else we saw. Kids are out as teachers, government employees are the teachers. So mm -hmm. it became the beginning, the replica of what we have today. And has the government done a good job of running oh, the schools? Excellent job. Yeah. That's why everybody wants to leave. Yeah. Um, now, I tell this story, I don't believe we can re uh, replicate the Lancaster system today. And but I assume that that's because of practical impediments that are up there? Well, the basic it? impediment is child labor. Child labor laws and union, teacher union hostility have been a terrific uh, uh, impediment to making the system go forward. So you see the union as a protectionist uh, well, entity right. w watching over its own turf and, and not that's wanting correct. to rock the boat. Correct. That's but there right. are movements, John, where I know you, you criticize charter schools or, or other voucher systems as being subsidies correct. of the government, but nevertheless they are a, an attempt to move away from just the status, status quo, government-run school where there's no concept of privatization, no concept of merit, just simply, you know, passing the kid one step to the next step. Right. So is that not a, uh, it may not be as radical as Lancaster, but isn't that a step in the right direction? No. Why not? They say the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Mm -hmm. No good intentions are trying to escape. But in fact, that's not going to happen. So they may have a couple of years where those that have the vouchers, those that go to the charter and magnet schools, get somewhat of an advantage. But they're going to be reeled in. The next generation will be reeled in. And so there may not be any private schools, any alternative. Everything will be public education 
and so the mess will be vastly worse. Well, basically what you're saying, John, is that a major part of the problem is that it's being run by government and it's That's not correct. privatized. And uh, for our viewers, uh, of course, the Libertarian Party offers an alternative. And um, if our viewers want to get more information about the Libertarian Party, I'm going to give you a couple of different websites. The National Libertarian Party can be found at www.lp.org. The Brooklyn chapter, because we're taping this in uh, very close to Park Slope in beautiful Brooklyn, can be found at www.brooklynlp.org. And the Manhattan chapter, because I come from far away on the other side of the East River, can be found at www.manhattanlp.org. And on each of those websites, our viewers can find additional information about the Libertarian Party, um, links to this fine TV show, uh, links to Surf City blog, links to other interesting uh, pro-freedom um, organizations. So I urge our viewers to take a look at any of those. John, we only have a couple of minutes left. Um, do you see any possibility of a free market education alternative, uh, maybe not as dramatic as Lancaster, but something like that happening in the 21st century? I'm optimistic. I've had very good luck with telling the story before about Lancaster. My objective has not been to say, let's replicate what he's done, because in many ways it's impossible with child labor laws, with the union opposition, but to put a bug in people's head that it was done before, it's not impossible. If it's been done before, maybe if I thought about it for a while, I can come up with a 21st century variation that would be that would work, and uh, and uh, public monopoly over education. Perhaps at a more local level than than trying to say all of New York State or yes. all of the United States, that's but correct. maybe local communities could that's try something. Absolutely correct. Now that's the way Lancaster started. He started one school in London. It was successful. He did two, and he gradually gained ground and gained recognition. And it started slowly and became a gigantic. Yeah. So it's how did, how did Lancaster end his life? He was killed on the west side of Manhattan in front of a bar because he was dead drunk and got rolled over by a beer, beer, oh beer wagon. Gosh. Okay, John, <laughs> our time is up, but I thank you very much. And I thank you, viewers. Please join us again for another edition of Hard Fire.